to have Christine Wetherly, um, who is an associate professor in pediatrics at McMaster. And she has a app called Joy Pop that she is going to um, discuss about with us today. So um, we're all really looking forward to um, hearing about it and I'm just gonna let her take it away. In terms of logistics, before we get started, if everyone can just turn off their mics and their videos, it'll work better um, in terms of uh, the video being smooth. And Christine has said that if we have questions, you can just pop in. So if you wanna just pop in, if you have any questions for her throughout her presentation. Okay, and I'm gonna sign off and you take it away. Okay, hi everybody. I'm happy to be here and thanks Andrew. Um, it really, this has come out of a chat between Andrew and I and I was really delighted to see that um, Andrew had had his own experiences in app development. Uh, so that was very, um, I'm not coming across that. Uh, there's not that many apps that get developed actually at McMaster. So this is kind of one of the uh, early uh, ones. And uh, just to give you a little quick on my background and my Western connection, uh, my undergrad uh, in psychology was at U of T, but my master's and PhD in clinical psychology was at Western. So I am a Western grad and uh, my areas have always been in the kind of broad area of family violence, but more so in child maltreatment. Um, if you are going to our Resilience in Youth uh, YouTube, you will see that, um, uh, you will see that uh, there's some videos that represent some research projects. There's one called the MAP study, which is a large study of child welfare involved youth, not just foster kids, where we got over got 561 youth and followed them up. And that was really the first study in Canada that looked at the mental health and substance use of youth. And the MAP study has generated over 35 publications. That video is just one set of findings. Um, we also have a CHR uh, team grant on sexual violence and um, there's a video there called C CSA or Child Sexual Abuse Prevention. So both of these studies help to inform this app in uh, what we've learned there. And um, so for example, in both the studies with males who were victimized sexually and in the MAP study, self-compassion uh, was indicated as a, as a mediator. And so that kind of directed us to use self-compassion in our journaling prompts to define it and use it. So there's that kind of connection to development of the app, not only the existing theories and prior to the app, we did consultation with a youth group we work a lot with, uh, Toronto Police uh, Services, um, uh, Teens Ending Abusive Relationships, or TEAR, um, youth leaders. And they run, if you want to catch up with them, they run a weekly Twitter chat, hashtag capital TEAR talk. So that's out of Toronto Police Victim Services. So uh, just to give you a bit of background, because that's not really in the slides um, that I'm going to be focusing on today. And I'm happy to ask and uh, answer any questions around that. So I also want to acknowledge my research coordinator, Savannah Smith, um, <clears throat> who's been extremely diligent about helping set up the uh, Joy Pop research that's building and ongoing. Okay. Let me just figure this out. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, there we go. Um, so in the background, when we're creating the app, we really did have 
you know, vulnerable youth, child welfare youth uh, uh, in mind, um, because our app was constructed around the ideas of being trauma informed. Uh, you may have heard of the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies or ACEs. There's a quite a volume of research looking at various population data sets, including populations of adolescents. And um, the ACE is, it's a 10 item questionnaire and that's represented up in the, the top right corner uh, where you have abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Perhaps of interest to you, you, you see that substance abuse uh, caregivers or substance abuse being held in the used in the household is one of the um, the issues, but uh, five out of the ten aces really are uh, family violence aces. So that they've experienced physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical, emotional neglect, and in you know at least in Canada, but not in the states, uh, mother treated violently. violently exposure to that would be considered child abuse as well. So the pyramid really talks about the findings of uh, how ACEs lead to um, negative outcomes. So they feel that experience these, experiencing these in childhood leads to neuro disrupted neurodevelopment. And one of the solid findings uh, among uh, kids who've been maltreated is a smaller corpus callosum. Uh, it then leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. And um, that's where the joy, that layer is where the joy pop comes in. Um, that there are just challenges in those areas, especially in terms of emotion regulation, for instance. Um, then if you don't have any intervention, uh, into this area, you will have uh, health risk behaviors that we would see in adolescents like substance use, uh, risky sexual practices. And then that sets up this kind of can foment, could be adolescent limited or foment into sort of more lifestyle thing. And then that can indicate, you know, more uh, morbidity issues and social problems in terms of maintaining employment or uh, having owning your own house or car and as well as early death early death from disease <clears throat> um, or uh, from suicidality and um, this is just this one just highlights some of the research showing like the multiple systems you might think aces and as often as the case with adverse experience, you think, oh, they're going to have mental health or substance use problems, but there's more, there's traumatic brain injury, more likely to get into car accidents, fractures, burns, unintended pregnancy and pregnancy complications, fetal death, uh, HIV and STDs, um, cancer and diabetes, and uh, heart issues, lung issues. Um, we mentioned uh, the risky sexual pra practices and substance use as a means of coping with the um, trauma symptoms and uh, challenges in reaching a full education, maintaining a job and having a full-time uh, income over time. And just to give you a bit of the most recent data around um, people don't tend to understand uh, what might be actually happening. And I think that uh, maybe in London, you've been more aware of sex trafficking things since that seems to be kind of active in recent years in London. Um, but this is from the US, which has a very good adolescent population survey every couple of years. Uh, and uh, just to look at the, the trends of uh, the question around, were you ever forced to have sex? So 7.4% of the population respond in the positive. You can see much higher in terms of female, but males are also 
um, assaulted. And um, when you chart across the years, there's no, there's no, um, it's a, it's a steady high rate from across the past decade, which if anything suggests we're probably not sig significantly seriously um, dealing with it. So this, the same as there was like in, again, in population studies, this idea that child sexual abuse was decre decreasing and the most recent reports um, of 2019 suggest that actually it's starting to uptrend. So that's just to give you a bit of background on the stats. Um, this is one theoretical system that is pretty interesting because it, it uh, really helps you to understand what's going on and when you have those adverse experiences that in the attachment system or the system you form with close people starts off with your um, caregivers but it could become then your partner uh, you would you know uh, having challenges and emotions can relate to and experiences in relationship can relate through things like um, clinging behaviors, um, uh, stalking kind of behaviors. These are all seen as strategies to increase the accessibility of a supportive caregiver. Um, that kind of uh, may overlap with something like borderline personality disorder as well, like those kinds of features. Uh, conversely, minimizing threat um, increases uh, you know, fear, vigilance, which we, I think we all probably understand what hypervigilance is when you're really sensitized to the environment and changes or uh, sounds in the environment uh, or feelings of discomfort. And you have the typical fight, flight, freeze, or faint response to uh, danger and various uh, cutoff behaviors. And in the long term, oops, sorry. In the long term, you have uh, this kind of uh, vulnerable to hopelessness and dysphoria and fatigue. And um, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing with uh, moving it forward. So I think this theory really um, emphasized the, the goal of eliminating threat or increasing safety um, and promoting the positive experiences um, as being um, uh, where to put your efforts. And this just kind of goes into that a bit more. So uh, it has these four classifications and this article is really t looking at parenting, um, but you can have a look at that if you want to start to look at where, you know, what how the aggression kinds of items go together, how the freezing kinds of items would go, behaviors would go together and so forth. And we're gonna be talking about resilience um, and I'm just drawing your attention to this paper. Uh, I think resilience is, I think, nested in with the, um, the sustainable development goals when it talks about uh, well-being and it is uh, something that if you have been maltreated and you're alive, you have resilience. Um, you had, have had resilience outcomes because you've managed to, managed to uh, you know, work with the environment that is chaotic or um, aggressive or neglecting. And this is the uh, web link. It wasn't in your PowerPoint, but this is the web link for this journal. This is a journal I started because there were no resilience journals. And it's open access, meaning it's free to submit and free to get the articles. So you might want to check that out. So when we look at this idea of uh, mental health apps, um, it is more recent research, obviously, and the er, an early review looking at literature across these time frames uh, really found that um, there were about five apps 
and four apps provide direct support for mental health professionals. So you get some linkage to the mental health professional and two of the five, these five apps were commercially available and none of them were youth focused. And then in this article, um, 24 publications on 15 apps uh, on apps identified as for youth under age 18. So uh, probably older children and uh, adolescents. There was two small RCTs which had showed no impact on mental health outcomes. However, none of these apps were specifically designed for youth. Um, they showed good feasibility and app usage. Um, but there, there's no standard outcomes. So I'm going to talk about a couple of pieces of the background of the Joy Pop app, but I'm not going to go to every piece of information because that would not get us into actually looking at the Joy Pop app and the uh, early research. So this is an interesting study where they were measuring uh, how adolescents were looking at this this picture and basically uh, what it shows um, is that your attentional patterns are impacted by your emotions where uh, the face uh, teens uh, focus 100% um, of teens focus their attention on the face um, being the conveyor of potentially the most emotion or where there's no emotion, it might be noteworthy. And otherwise the limbs were um, higher as compared to um, an, ob an object or a hand, but this red object actually got a lot of attention. So they are teens generally, these are just general teens, are aware, at least in an eye tracking study, um, to uh, um, provocative content and to looking at emotional content to the face. So for teens to actually neglect processing this kind of emotion requires a lot of cognitive effort on their part. The other piece to look at some of the Tetris uh, game, I'm sure you're familiar with that, at least some of you, and the research on trauma, again, being very interesting and, and it's kind of a game that has had the most research. Um, so uh, PTSD, which you may understand as, you know, when you have the ACEs, a uh, trauma event, or you may or may not have a trauma response. If you have a trauma response, it can include post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And it's not just um, for these kinds of violence experiences, but it also includes any kind of experience where the, where the person felt that they were in danger or risk of dying. The mechanism put forward for Tetris is that high visu visual spatial demands um, having a task that would engage those demands would disrupt the consolidation of sensory elements of trauma memory. Uh, so it would be impair, expect to impair memory reconsolidation. So, y you know, you'd expect that um, if, so we did a study with Paul Fruin and he did a meditation study, it's published. And what he asked is what, what, what were they thinking during the meditation? Like, you know, meditation, you're not supposed to be thinking, you're just supposed to be focusing on your breathing. But um, there was a tendency for individuals with maltreatment backgrounds to be having intrusive memory, intrusive thoughts. So with something like Joy Pop, you wouldn't want them to be doing jo Joy Pop and having intrusive thoughts and not having a, a, a way to deal with that. So they can pop over into the, the Tetris if they're remembering things. Uh, one study from Germany looked at uh, patients with complex PTSD, which is um, most definitely they've had uh, child maltreatment and it's likely to be familial maltreatment involvement and severe. And uh, they also, I mean, it's not 
unusual to have PTSD and major depression. And most were taking medications. Uh, so they were excluded if they had recent substance abuse and active suicidality. Um, what they did was do a um, CBT and then they included 25 minutes of, of Tetris and they subsequently recorded their arousal levels and intrusive memories. Um, so they found that they had, they had found that um, there was reductions in intrusive thoughts and um, yeah, I'm just reducing my, repeating myself there, oops. Great. And they did a study in the UK, I believe, and they looked at the capacity to prevent PTSD symptoms among uh, ER um, persons waiting who have been in like motor vehicle accidents. And so they played Tetris while they were in the waiting room and later they were asked to, to, to recall the memory of their um, accident. And they found that uh, they showed fewer intrusive uh, memories. So to start to talk about Joy Pop. So Joy Pop was created as a resilience app to support the formation of daily resilience. So it's kind of a broad mandate where if you're in situations of stress, you know, I'm having a more stressful day, this could be um, helpful to you. The key target was emotion regulation. It is a positively oriented app. So when you look at other apps, they may have unintended negative consequences in how they structure their activity. So some apps talk about negative mood and then, you know, ask about depression and then ask to, you know, how many layers of depression did they feel? So visually they're seeing like block on top of block, like a block that's, and on non-depressed days, they see one block. So visually that might actually make them more depressed because they're getting higher blocks of depression. So that's not uh, the approach we took. We focused on positives and positive reinforcements. Um, the trauma-informed aspects are in different things. As you see on the uh, top right of the landing page, there's a phone icon. And when you click that, you get a host of 24-7 uh, uh, helplines or crisis lines. Um, and that allows you, so whenever you're in the app, if you are feeling really distressed, you could go call a helpline on every page that appears. Um, and I'll talk about things that are um, trauma-informed along the, as we go. The other piece is that whenever you do any activity, you get a motivational message and a thumbs up. So we reinforce your, you know, doing any activity or, or um, whether, you know, you're rating a negative mood or positive mood, you'll still kind of get that, that message motivational message and just different things uh, would happen. And we really tried to work on the user experience. We did this app with ClearBridge Mobile and we, you know, how do we have simple iPhones, the kind of uplifting color scheme. And what you set have here is one of the features which is art draw. And uh, you know, it's basically you can use your finger to do these things, you can make a drawing or you could write words or you could play X's and O's with somebody. It's kind of just an open um, feature. And we've created this first in iOS. So just to look at this landing page, this is the mood ratings. This is the journaling. This is the safe social connecting, which is uh, this kind of like a circle of trust. And this is a calendar. Every time you do your journaling, it shows up in your calendar and you can almost read it like a diary. And these are your activities that include the Tetris-like game called Square Moves, uh, a deep breathing, and this art draw that you see. 
So the mood ratings, it really starts off with this one. How happy are you today? And this on your touch screen moves up and down like a wave. And the back end data captures that as a number, either from zero to 100. And if you're 50% or lower on your happy rating, you will get these three icons popping up uh, as that you can rate these. Uh, if you are higher up, say, on your mood, happy mood rating, you get a motivational message and a thumbs up, like you're doing the right, you're doing the right things, keep going. If you are into here at all, and when you save it, you will get a prompt that says, basically, do you want to do something about it? Would you like to go to the activities? Or maybe later, for instance. There's no push notifications in this app, so uh, even though you said maybe later, you're not going to push kit notification saying, hey, um, you said you want to do the activity. So we're just trying to keep it as positive as possible. So you can rate what would be sad, angry, or meh, and uh, just kind of blah, how's it going? Um, so that's the mood reading the resilience journaling and as i mentioned it goes into the calendar so you see a calendar so example name a compassionate way you've supported a friend recently then write down how you can do the same for yourself you write a title for it and then you write your thoughts you can actually write your thoughts or you could use emojis uh, and um, you can also, because you're uh, on your phone, you can use the microphone function and just talk about it. Uh, so whatever is available on your phone, you could do that. And at any point, if you want to share something with your circle of trust, you could say, you know, screenshot that and share that or with people or whatever. And we move into the diaphragmatic breathing exercises. There are two types of breathing, balanced breathing and relaxation breathing. So this is basically your, you get a body map that cues you to, you know, relax your forehead and clench your jaws. It just is a map of a person with these cues and that will always come up. So you're always kind of cued into how to, to be in your breathing exercise. And, um, so for balanced breathing, you know, you just breathe in at an even count and breathe out through your nose at an even count. Um, um, so we have this uh, circle here and so I'll have the text cue and the circle when you're breathing in expands out and when you're breathing out goes in. So. It's a visual guide. Uh, in the relaxation breathing, it, it really means that uh, you're trying to induce uh, sort of more relaxation and, um, uh, you know, it's COPD breathing. So you, it's also called pucker lip breathing. So most people don't know that. So it becomes a bit of a novel sort of breathing um, than just you know, focusing on the air going through your nose and it has a standard count and it goes out. So the breathing is really good in terms of, you know, we suggest when you open, we suggest bookending your day with the map, with the um, app. And so you may wake up and do this very brief, you know, couple minute exercise and it kind of sets you up for the day. It's also very good for moving in between tasks. So we can rush between Zoom meetings, for instance, but if we stop in, drop in and do a breathing exercise, it kind of gives a reset. Uh, and also when you're feeling anxious or stressed or panicky, going into the breathing is a, is a good friend to reducing those symptoms. The safe social connecting, would you like to talk to someone in a circle of trust? Uh, youth input, family, friends, and professionals are color-coded, and um, you, they input their uh, contact information, and they can drop into this and contact someone, whether they wanna share good news or they're feeling distressed, 
And if they don't succeed in reaching their contact person, they come back into the app. So in terms of like, there's backend data across all of this, that timestamps when you use something and uh, like in the mood, you get a number for that. And for say social, social connecting, we get to know whether it was a professional family or friend that was contacted um, basically. And so if you were a worker or addictions counselor, you might be one of the people inputted in there, which might be particularly relevant during COVID. And we're going on to our study. Um, this is done with uh, Ashlyn Mushkosh in the lead and done with uh, first year uh, Lakehead University entries. It's a uh, convenient sample. So more, more females than males signed up for the study. As you know, your first year university student is typically a uh, late adolescent. And uh, what was surprising what, for them was uh, it, nearly 80% reported at least one of those 10 ACEs having occurred to them and 30% reported four or more. So actually when with adolescents, the cutoff, you know, you when you do a cutoff score on ACEs, it's really three and with adults it's four. So you would expect that with the more ACEs they have risk to those uh, health risk behaviors um, being manifested. And so the design we asked, as I mentioned, the request was to use the app twice a day for four weeks. And in this 28 trial of recommended daily use, the range was from two to 28 with the median being 20 days. So I think that shows more towards feasibility that, you know, while these individuals are in school, they're using the app. Um, questionnaires were administered at midpoint and at um, post the month. She's gotten approval to continue to collect data. So there will be a COVID type study. And then there's also qualitative interviews. So what she's looked at and what's under review at American Psychologist is um, the questionnaire data. She hasn't done a, a um, paper on the backend data yet. So these are the measures you saw the advert, the ACEs, uh, the Connors Davidson is a fairly typical measure seen in resilience. The patient health questionnaire, uh, tap depression distress, and uh, the DERS uh, for emotion regulation is a well utilized questionnaire. The executive fun functioning index was used. These are all standard. Uh, questionnaires in the literature. And what we found was those with higher baseline ACEs scores had here higher depressive symptoms, higher difficulties with emotion regulation and lower executive functioning so that we would expect to see more change in those with uh, m multiple ACEs. And what we see here is the um, emotion regulation, the DERS short form. And uh, you see that the app use is going in the right direction. Um, so uh, it's helpful if we think that we're targeting emotion regulation, that it seems like potentially we are targeting it. And it also uh, when we looked at the depression distress outcomes, uh, we saw a significant drop over time, so mid and post. And that, I think, is important because we want to be sure that the Joy Pop app does no harm. So it's not that it's, you know, increasing depressive symptoms or increasing anxiety symptoms. It seems to be, or increasing PTSD symptoms, uh, all these measures show declines. And just to um, be a bit closer look at the emotion regulation, we saw significant changes between time one and time two. So even after two weeks of use, there was a significant drop. And 
um, uh, sorry, time one and time three, and also uh, between time two midpoint and time three. So um, we show a significant drop across the whole um, um, from here to here, as well as a significant drop from here to here. So I think that this encourages further research. Uh, it suggests that it's feasible because they are using it on average 20 out of the 28 days. It suggests that um, it seems to not do harm, at least in terms of self-report data. And um, this is not linked uh, to the usage levels or types of use, like you can do quite sophisticated things with the backend data because of its, everything being timestamped. So you could say, well, if they rated, if they rated on depression uh, or, or any of the negative affects, what did they do next? You can do the kind of conditional probabilities. Um, and also this is not, as I mentioned, not linked to the backend data. So we don't know if, uh, for instance, if you uh, rated those negative moods, you went on and actually did journaling more often. Or um, when you did a happy mood, did you more often go on to journaling or the art? Or did you, in the negative moods, did they use the Tetris type game, square moves? So the, there's a lot of research to still to be done, but um, this is the first kind of research done. It's the app was just available a year ago. So when we look at resilience, uh, we do see that it's going the right direction as in it's moving up. Uh, what we found was that males had higher scores and we found that also in the self-compassion that males tend to have higher scores than females. And this change over time approach significance so my way of looking at that is while the Connors-Davidson is a measure that's often used, um, it tends to conceptualize resilience as a trait rather than as a dynamic process or skill set or a state. So in some conceptualizations of resilience, you have to have external resources to be able to, to galvanize your inner resources, um, whether that's a you know, option to be having a case management or therapy or a supportive partner or, you know, food banks in the community. Um, so this measurement of resilience, we have a few measures and uh, it'll just take a bit to kind of figure out how to measure what we want to measure. In terms of the participant feedback, uh, these are some of the qualitative quotes. I felt like it helped. It, it brings self-awareness to how I was feeling every day. As I've used it more and more, it's kind of became part of my daily routine, which we really, that's kind of like the goal, um, especially in vulnerable populations where it's hard to organize a daily routine. Um, I really liked using the journal feature. I would write about how I was feeling that day. If I was anxious or in a stressful situation, the games or the drawing really helped. I could go into the breathing exercise and it kind of reset my mood. So in a summary, you know, this is a, the, our first research done in Northern Ontario at a university. Um, we're continuing to do analyses with that data set. And uh, Abby Goldstein is looking at um, the impacts on cigarette smoking, alcohol use, and cannabis use. Um, Abby is a substance uh, researcher. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't ask vaping uh, in the questionnaire. Um, at Western, uh, there's interest, Shannon Stewart is interested in developing it with uh, a mental health, ch child needs mental health sample. And Paul Froon, who I mentioned about um, the other uh, study on mindfulness and kind of the thoughts that came up uh, is doing a virtual reality meditation intervention, which is uh, published as well. And so he had thought of doing the joy pop as an adjunct or as a, you know, in an, an act of control. 
Um, so in terms of applications, you can always think of it as pre an intervention. Um, you can always think of it as a post or the booster for an intervention that's time limited. It can be an adjunct and um, it can potentially be, if you have an intervention, kind of a low effort intervention comparison. So we have uh, current grants running with uh, testing the JoyPod app with Masters of Social Work student entries uh, with child welfare involved youth in foster care who are transitioning out of the system uh, with Six Nations Youth on Reserve and one is just starting out with youth in the mental health system. And we're seeking to do RCTs with young adults uh, with the Youth in Care Canada network, so former youth in care, former youth who were in out of home care, and Indigenous male youth are, um, I have been identified as a very vulnerable population during this COVID. And there's international interest to, to do this with low and middle income countries, um, like grand challenges type of thing. And uh, um, we definitely welcome uh, research projects happening. So as I mentioned, there's a couple of JoyPot videos. And um, maybe at this point, I'll just, uh, those are the resources. And uh, this is a, uh, a handout developed by Futurum, which went globally to students. And um, that's on the Youth Resilience website. We have Joy Pop on Instagram and Twitter and Face page. So we hope that you are, if you're interested, following. And that's the end of the slideshow. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. That was wonderful. It was really interesting. So we have a bit of time now for questions. Um, I'll start. I have a question. I'm just wondering about your design because it's so beautiful. Um, did you consult with young people when you were designing it or what was the process in the, the design of the app? Yeah, there's several, several uh, certainly we had in mind we wanted to have, you know, an uplifting um, color scheme and simple icons. So the actual designers who worked on it were young adults and at Clearbridge. Um, and we did uh, talk with, like I mentioned, the youth in uh, Toronto Police Victim Services about what they wanted to see in the app or wh and which apps they found uh, that they use and what, and we can like, if they use, I'll use Snapchat, then we can look at what are those features. We also started this off as a project with undergrad students in computer sciences. So we had, you know, first year to, I think first year to third year students work on this and they utilize their, uh, you know, each one had a peer group within university and utilize that to kind of get feedback. So what they really worked on was, for instance, the mood readings. And um, we try to look at like a wide number of moods, wider number of moods, uh, but the youth couldn't really differentiate between like the finer gradations of mood. Uh, so that's why we stuck with a few amounts. But they, what they, um, you know, the, their kind of feedback was, you know, to do like an emoji kind of a mood to have more, you know, a simplified mood. And then the app developers made that simpler because that's their expertise into what you see. That's awesome. So for everyone else, um, maybe if you just pop into the chat, if you have a question, just put your name and then we can call you up instead of in case people are calling one by one or Jason has his hand up. Maybe they, oh, <laughs> how did you do that? Is that under reaction? You can do that under participants. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So maybe if people just raise their hand if they want to ask a question. That's awesome. Thank you. 
Okay, so so hi, I'll ask my question. Uh, uh, thank you very much, for Christine, for uh, coming. Um, we, we we talked a lot on the phone uh, a few months ago about the about the app and, and different technologies. Um, I'm really interested in kind of. Uh, it, I'm Jason Andrew Gilliland, so there we go. <laughs> um, we um, I'm wondering about the back end part of it, the te technolo technological parts. Um, we you because right now the app is in the wild, right? You are, you are able to download it from the app store yep. as well as an app used in studies. So how do you control, I guess, uh, where, where do you store the data and how is the data stored and what is the difference between someone who downloads it and then someone who uses it for, um, yeah. for a study? And just, can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about the technology? Sure. So when you go to the store to download it, um, uh, we don't, it's, it's uh, no in-app purchases. We don't collect the data. We're not selling that any data to any third party. Um, and you can't, uh, like for instance, you can't access backend data. Um, you don't need the internet to use the app. Uh, the internet is only needed if we're in the research study to collect the data. Mm. Um, and uh, the things like what they write in the text, that's not captured. Okay. So because, again, from the trauma perspective, if somebody writes suicide, you know, what do you do with that? I mean, we do have helplines, but I think that might call for a bit more, uh, like contact the person. Although in social media, they don't have, it's very poor whenever I've sent stuff to Twitter or Instagram saying, I think this is a problem for mental health. They never found it to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't, they don't have a protocol, but I thought that we would, should have to have a protocol, mm -hmm. like a linkage to mental, offer a linkage to mental health professional. Um, so the back end data is not available to when you purchase it. That's only part of the research, and we don't absorb the text. Um, okay, thank you. And I, I didn't answer the store. It's you know we store uh, in Canada. We we store in a Canadian server, and some research is going to go happen in the states, and they'll store on a U.S. server. So we have a cloud account. Great, thanks. Okay, and I see Malcolm has a question. Malcolm, do you wanna ask your question now? Hi, yes, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Hi, Christine, um, I'm Malcolm. I'm one of Jason Gilland's master's students. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation, very informative, and I'm a big fan of ecological momentary assessment, so it certainly reminds me of it. Uh, my question is a little, or questions are a little uh, simpler. Um, I was wondering if uh, anyone in your group or yourself has uh, wondered about how to using the app promotes exposure to green spaces or to nature for the users. We do. I'm part of the other research that I'm involved with is funded by the Global Water Futures, and that's the research I'm doing with Six Nations and trying to. Um, Really focus on water access quality, the 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 healing properties of water, etc. Right. Um, I know, as you probably also know, the research that sh that the experimental research is that if you look at green space or you look at concrete buildings, your performance on tasks are different. Uh -huh. um, and. Uh, we did in an exercise idea try to think about how could we do like ha like this was in the early stages how could we have them go outside or this and that and then i thought you know i have to think a little bit better about like the challenges like because we don't want unintended negative consequences we don't want people to say go to a park when i know in child welfare youth will get, um, you know, they'll go to a park to meet a drug dealer and then get assaulted, sexually assaulted by a group of males. Um, so we have to kind of work through all those challenges. Um, so 
I don't think we have settled on a, a good idea about it. I had thought about like a slideshow of um, natural things uh, might be like drop into this slideshow of, you know. Stay alongside breathing exercises. Yeah, um, it could be. Uh, we are, this isn't like the final version of this app. This is like the first version of this app. Mm. So right now the app developers are working because of the water, cons, uh, the stuff in water, um, a ease to sleep, a function where you're listening to water sounds and you seeing nice water visuals. Um, so they're working on that. Um, that comes from, you know, I know that there's two, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple pieces missing, one sleep and um, one is exercise. There's a lot of exercise apps, right? But, uh, you know, actually, they often those apps are not like a person in the background, uh, different positive backgrounds. They're usually an animation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we knew that from our research on sleep in our MAP study, 60% of child welfare youth had sleep onset problems. So, um, which is understandable if bad things happened at night or you feel like your household, your household is chaotic, there's traffic in and out all day at all times of the day and night. That um, also so include uh, sleep distraction during sleeping? Uh, this this particular uh, feature. I'm well, you mentioned uh, sleep onset issues was also a correlation with uh, this like sleep disturbances. Um, uh, what do you mean by sleep disturbances? Are you mean like by like sleep walking during or? or something that uh, caused them to become awake uh, during their sleep? Unless oh, like you know, nightmares. Well, actually, more from the environment itself, I would imagine. Um, oh yeah, there yeah could you be mentioned lots chaotic environments that yeah. was ongoing during their sleep, their attempt to sleep anyway. Yeah, there there could be that. There could be like that. That's a time when they get assaulted. Um, there could be other issues, uh, like sleepwalking. There could be other issues, like you know nightmares, um, a fear of nightmares. So with PTSD, it's really a fear of triggers, right? Uh -huh. So, um, yeah. Any ideas you have, I'm open to hearing about it. <laughs> oh, thanks very much for answering my question. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> great. So we have maybe um, time for one more question. If anybody else has anything, they can pop up. Doesn't look like anyone's popping in. Okay, so I think we will maybe just end it there. I just want to say thank you so much again. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your experiences and learning more about the app. It's wonderful, and hopefully we'll um, have more uh, information about it as the project unfolds. And maybe you can come back and tell us more um, about your other studies as it evolves. Yes. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine. No problem. Thanks, Jason. Stay well.